It's 2023 and smart home tech is still a bit too complex. Whether you're starting or expanding your smart home, I'll walk you through everything you need to know. The first thing you need to do is pick a smart home platform. With the Matter standard rolling out and more on that later, cross-platform products are going to become more common in the smart home. But you still need to choose what platform you're primarily going to use to set up, control, and automate all of your smart home devices. This will help guide you on what types of smart home devices your smart home can accommodate today. If you find the idea of setting up your own smart home pretty daunting, or you just have a really complicated install, you can hire an integrator. If you still need a bit of help, but don't want to shell out a ton of money, some retailers like Best Buy and Google here in the US, for example, will offer consultation services, which are sometimes even free. So which platform should you go with? Well, for beginners who are interested in the offerings from the big three tech companies, in my experience, Amazon and Apple's platforms are the easiest to use for beginners. They both give helpful hints in their apps and have dedicated sections for tips. Amazon will even go a step further and automatically set up some smart home devices when you just plug them in. If you're deep into the Google ecosystem though, then of course I think it makes sense to look at Google Home. Same thing if you're an Apple household, you're likely going to want to look at HomeKit. But one thing to be cautious of with all of these platforms is lock-in and automations. That's where third-party options like Homey or Home Assistant can be really useful. Homey is definitely easier to use and get started with, though it does offer a sandbox coding environment and the new Homey Pro is based on the Raspberry Pi architecture, so there's definitely something there for the more technically advanced. Home Assistant is an awesome open source home automation platform, but I would only recommend it for people who like to tinker and already know what they're doing and have the time to maintain the install when something breaks. So, so now that you've picked your platform, you can start buying devices for your smart home. The first device category I'd start with is lighting. You can control a single bulb, turn in it on and off from your phone or with your voice, control lights in multiple rooms at once like holiday lights, and even change the color of your lights, creating beautiful lighting scenes to wake up and go to bed to. Now, typically the smart bulbs you see will be full color so they can produce a wide variety of colors with the smart bulb, or you'll see bulbs that can just produce different shades of white. So you have like a daylight here at like 5,500 Kelvin, or you go to something that's like 3,000 Kelvin, which is a little bit warmer. Now, if you're going to get smart bulbs and you don't need the full color, my recommendation would be to at least to make sure the bulb that you get can adjust its color temperature somewhat. That way you're not gonna get a situation where you have like one fixture that's like candlelight that you can't change and then all of your smart bulbs are just set to just more of a daylight color and you have a lighting mismatch. I really think that looks bad in most homes. A lot of people don't pay enough attention to that, but having all of your light that can be at the same color temperature, I'm a big stickler for and I think just looks a lot better and is just more pleasant to be in, honestly. There are several companies that make smart light bulbs, including Philips Hue, Wise, GE Sync, which is now owned by Savant, Govi, LifeX, and Nanoleaf, just to name a few. In general, I always try to make the bulb smart first. They're much easier to swap out and change. They're also very renter friendly as well if you're renting a home or apartment, and it's just less complicated than trying to replace the light switch in the wall. I do recommend the smart light switches though, but just for fixtures where you can't already make the bulb smart. The next category of device I'd recommend getting is the smart thermostat. I'd still suggest going with the Nest Learning thermostat if you like the idea of not having to set a schedule and just having the thermostat learn your patterns. Or you could go with something like the Ecobee or other smart thermostats that allow you to set a schedule in an app. Next, let's talk about your voice and music. Smart speakers are one of the easiest ways to control things in your smart home with action like, hey, turn off the lights. Oh, wrong lights. Apple, Amazon, and Google all make their own smart speakers that we've done reviews on, and not only are they great for smart home control, but they also bring multi-room audio to your home as well. Multi-room audio is where you have multiple speakers in a given room or several rooms all playing the same media at the same time. After testing so many of these speakers, Sonos to me is the clear winner and brand I overall recommend because of how easy it is to use their system, the sheer number of 
different speakers and soundbars they offer, and because many of their speakers now support both the Amazon and Google Assistant. So how do you group all of these different speakers from different companies together? Well, the tricky thing is you actually can't for some speakers. The two predominant technologies for grouping speakers are Google Cast and Apple's AirPlay 2, but some speakers will only work with one and not the other, and some like Amazon's won't work with either. So just be careful when buying smart speakers for your home and try to avoid as much lock-in as possible, even though all of these ecosystems do have some form of lock-in. This is why I love Sonos speakers. They have their own internal speaker grouping mechanism, but importantly, they also support Apple's AirPlay 2. And even if you don't have an iPhone or an iPad, you can still benefit from AirPlay 2, like a Mac using the Apple Music app to a group of AirPlay speakers, or my personal favorite use for AirPlay, outputting sound from an Apple TV 4K. This way, when I'm in the kitchen or say someone's in the bathroom, you can still hear everything going on from the TV. And yes, this is the perfect feature for a Super Bowl or Oscar watch party. Also, many modern TVs and streaming devices like the Apple TV, Amazon Fire Cube, and Chromecast with Google TV allow you to control content on your TV with smart assistants and even turn off the entire system with your voice. Next up, safety and security. Now Nowadays, many security systems can be integrated into your smart home platform. This includes systems you get from the big home security companies or the more do-it-yourself security systems. The tech included in these systems includes things like cameras, motion sensors, video doorbells, window sensors, alarms, and more. But there's also a second part to security in your home that I think is equally important. Things like smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and leak detectors, which you can place behind objects like your hot water heater or toilet and get notified as soon as a leak is detected. The last category of devices you can add to your smart home is appliances. Many stoves, ovens, and refrigerators are now equipped with Wi-Fi, allowing you to do things like remotely turn off the oven or even get an alert when your fridge detects you've run out of something. Robotic vacuum cleaners also fit in this category and not only automate the boring task of vacuuming, but a lot of them can learn your floor plan as well. And in extension of this technology is now being applied to robotic mops for hard floors, and yes, there are also robotic lawnmowers coming onto the market now as well. Other appliances you can add to your smart home include air purifiers like the Blue Air dust magnet we reviewed, HVAC systems and ones with dehumidifiers, and even smart showers. They have precise temperature control, sauna steam automation, and music speakers embedded in the shower heads with smart assistants built in. But if you really want music in your shower, I'd recommend getting a smart speaker that has Wi-Fi built in and is waterproof. That way you don't always have to connect your phone to it over Bluetooth just to play music. Next up, blinds and curtains. This is another big category of devices to automate. You can go the more expensive route and get the smart wood blinds or roller shades from companies like Lutron. And if you're doing new construction or a remodel, you can hire an electrician to wire power up to where you plan to have your blinds or shades installed. There are also robots that can open and close curtains made by companies like Akara and SwitchBot. Speaking of SwitchBot, they make this cool little nifty robot that can basically automate any device in your home that can be controlled by the press of a button. The last device you can use to make any device in your home smart is the smart plug. These can control any device you have plugged into a wall outlet and are great for things like decorations, Christmas lights, fans, heaters, etc. So that's my list of devices and categories for the smart home, but of course that's only half of the smart home equation. The whole point of connecting all of these devices together is the ability to control and automate them. The big three smart home platforms have pretty basic routine and automation functionality, with HomeKit now even letting you create automations by just using your voice with Siri. Set all lights to turn off at 2 a.m. every night. I've set all the lights to turn off at 2 a.m. starting tomorrow night. If you want to use a platform that has more advanced automation features that can connect to more services, but still be easy to use, that's where I think Homey in particular would be a good option. And we'll be testing out their new Homey Pro device that you can use to run all of your automations locally once they ship out here in the US. Now, in general, there are two main types of automations for the smart home. You have schedule-based automations and trigger-based automations. And here are a few examples of automations I've set up here in 
in my own smart home. My espresso machine turns on every morning at 8 a.m. My thermostat is set to 73 degrees at 9 a.m. The blinds automatically close at sunset. My lights turn to a sunset color at 11.30 p.m. and then slowly fade out for 45 minutes. And all lights, if they haven't turned off already, are set to turn off at 1 a.m. All of those, except for my lights changing to a sunset color, were set up using the smart home automation platforms from the big three tech companies. For the lights, most of the big platforms aren't advanced enough to do what you can do in the Philips Hue app. Now, the second category of automation you can do within a smart home is trigger-based, and there are a few subcategories within this family of automations as well, and the first one is voice commands like saying movie time to your assistant and then your lights dim down and the blinds close. Sensor-based triggers are the second subcategory. For example, when your motion sensor detects no one is home, your lights can be set to automatically turn off. Acara actually now makes a new millimeter wave sensor that can detect respiratory rates, so it knows when you're still home and it's not gonna turn the lights out on you if you're just sitting down reading a book. The last cool trigger you can set up is one based on other smart devices. For example, when you tell your smart assistant to turn off the TV, as soon as it does that, your lights will slowly dim up. Now, the last thing to talk about is the new smart home matter standard. And if you followed my advice from last year's video, you'll remember that I said, you should just wait until these matter devices come onto the market before buying devices for your smart home. Now that it's been a year, that advice turned out to be misguided. The standard took a bit longer than anticipated to be finalized last year. However, now that it has been finalized and is rolling out, my advice this year is to buy the smart home devices you need today, but if you can, make sure they either support Matter or will be updated to Matter at a later date. And for a deeper dive into the Matter smart home standard, how it works, how it changes the smart home, and most importantly, what do you actually need to make it work, check out the explainer I did and you can get to it by clicking the thumbnail here. And for all of the reviews and videos we've done on the products I've mentioned in this video, plus the purchase links for them so you can check their current price, all of that information is in the description below. Hit that thumbs up button if you like this video and most importantly, you found it helpful. Thanks so much for watching.